Good morning. Good morning. I'm gonna not use a mic because y'all can hear me, right? I can't hear, but you guys can hear me. Inviting people to church, actually, for me, as outgoing as I am, is actually kind of hard to invite people I know. People I don't know, my mechanic, I can invite. People I don't know, I'm people I do know, I'm like everybody I know goes to church. And actually, that's not true. So we want you guys to invite people you know to come to church on Easter. And Rob has been telling us all to fill these out for the last two weeks. Those of you who have, thank you. We're going to mail them something so that when you go to invite them, it will go a little bit smoother, like the ladies, not like the guys and that poor dog. I feel really bad for that dog. <laughs> um, but I do want to welcome you to those of you, everybody knows me, but I'm Jennifer. And um, we want to welcome you here to the Odyssey. We thank you for coming out. The weather has been absolutely horrible, but we're so thankful that it's not snow. So we thank you for coming and joining us. Um, so, but we do want to tell you that if you haven't filled out the connection card, fill out the connection card. If you haven't, or just, just to stay updated, and this is the part where I'm supposed to tell you what you already know, that everything that you see is that we've ever done can be found on YouTube since the beginning of time, which seems like a long time, but it's actually only been five months. And for those of you who've been coming for the past five and a half months, it's actually, we've grown quite a bit, you know? It's, you know, we've gotten made a lot of changes, and we've made it, we're growing for the good, and I'm just really excited to see where we go from here. Um, and today's a special service. It's not special because of the message, although I'm sure that will be good, Rob. Um, <laughs> but today's a special service, because today we're gonna honor, um, we're gonna talk about Lent, sorry. And Rob posted on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, that we're gonna be going through as a church and these calendar. And we, everybody should have one. They're over there by the door. Um, and basically, we're gonna, every day, we're going to have something to fast from, pray for, and read. So, And then over the past 40 days, we're going to be able to actually read through the entire four Gospels, the entire four accounts of the life of Jesus Christ. And it seems like a lot, but I just did this recently, and I can tell you it goes by fast. And it's actually fascinating to see the different perspectives from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as to what they say. Some of the stories are repeated in all four Gospels. Some of them have different things in each that you only find in their Gospels. So I really encourage you to read it. This week, we're going to fast from one meal a day, and we're going to be reading through Matthew, which should be easy because that's what we've been talking about. And then this week, we're going to pray for different parts of the, of the church. And then on Saturday, we're going to do service Saturdays. We want you to help do something special. This week, we're going to do something special for a neighbor. That's easy enough to do, right? And then every Sunday we're going to have resurrection celebration to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is why we're all here, because that's really where the church started, was when he was resurrected. And then today we're going to do something very special. We're going to honor Black History Month, which is the month of February, which is actually almost over. I can't believe it. Um, the songs like Bryce and Jimmy and Diana just sang, we're going to be singing in a bit, they're all traditional spiritual hymns from written in the 1800s. And these hymns were important because they weren't just hymns, they weren't just songs. A lot of times they also held coded messages. But if you think of the slaves, you think of what they went through, and through it all, they kept their faith, they kept their hope when they were in the most horrible conditions a human can even go through. And slavery is often thought of when you think of the southern United States, but it's actually all throughout our country's history, even out west. And it's me being from the deep south myself, I'm originally from Mississippi, it's not only a part of my country's history, it's part of my history. My family managed plantations where slaves were on. Some of them owned slaves. We don't like to talk about it, but it's a fact. I can date my ancestry back in this country 400 years, and slavery is actually a really big part of it. So for me today, it's kind of special. Because what resounds me about the slaves is that even when they were going through the most horrible conditions of being tortured and working, and they still kept their faith. They still held church services. They still preached the gospel. They still kept their faith and kept their hope. 
So, but slavery is not a new idea. It's not something new to America. It actually dates way back to the back of the Bible, to the front of the Bible in the Old Testament. When Jacob brought his tribe, eventually known as the Hebrews, to Egypt, and at first, yes, they were servants, and they worked alongside the Egyptians. But soon after that, they actually became slaves. And we all know Moses took them out of the desert and took them through the desert and freed the, the slaves from Egypt. But slavery in the Bible and for God's chosen people doesn't end there. Last week I was sick and I had basically three days stuck in bed, nothing to do but read and watch videos. So I found myself re-watching the miniseries of the Bible. And I was struck that not just when Moses leaving his people, but all throughout the Bible, slavery, God's chosen people have had to fight. They have been slaves. They were tortured. But they still kept their faith. They still believed in God. They still prayed, much like the slaves in the 1800s and the music we did today. So it struck me that the slaves back then, in the biblical times, 6,000 years ago, and the slaves 200 years ago, they still knew what we all need to remember, that this life is temporary. No matter what we're going through, no matter how hard we struggle, this life is temporary, and the eternal life, the promised land, is perfect. A better way of saying this is Hebrews 13.3, where Paul wrote, Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt your pain in your own bodies. We do need to remember. We do need to remember those that have struggled. Remember that if they can do it, we can do it. Would you all pray with me? Lord, thank you for delivering your slaves to freedom. Thank you for delivering us to freedom. And thank you for the ability to never forget those that have suffered and yet never lost their faith. For they know, as I know, that you are good, you are holy, you paid the ultimate price for our freedom. Be with us today as we sing the words of your people sang hundreds of years ago, and may we never forget their messages of hope. Be with Pastor Rob as he delivers your word, your message, and may each of us leave here today knowing you just a little bit more. Well, I do want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, the last couple of weeks, the weather has been just absolutely horrendous, so we do thank you for braving this weather and coming out. I, uh, I saw something last night that uh, really hit home with me. There, there, there's something in the Jewish faith called Tikkun Olam. And I'm going to quote from a Jewish rabbi. And, and, and this is what he says. He says, one of the great differences that set Jews apart from other cultural groups is that we see our wealth as a means to partner with God as a way to bring God's kingdom into this earth. A concept which we call Tikkun Olam, which means perfecting or repairing the world. Amen. Now what a wonderful thought that on. He goes on to say we perfect the world by using our God-given wealth to further God's realm on this planet. So what you see is that the Jewish people's pursuit of wealth is often paired with the pursuit of charitable works. Now as I thought about that, I said wouldn't it be great if all of us thought that the reason that we got our wealth or our money was to help repair this planet. We felt so good about destroying. That if we took our wealth and said, okay, part of this, why God's blessing us, is so that we can glorify God through making his realm, this planet, a, a more prosperous, a better place to live in. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought about it, that's exactly what the mission of the Odyssey Church is. And, and you may not know this if you haven't read the bylaws, but our bylaws are very specific. Out of every dollar given, we put 10% into a missions fund, 8% of which goes to local ministries, 2% which goes to international ministries. And we've been able to help support a trip to Costa Rica, a trip to Haiti. We're getting ready to help my daughter who's going to be interned down in uh, Costa Rica for a whole year. Uh, you know, 2% is not a lot, but we can do a little bit. But what it does is the more that we give as a church, the more we can help people. The 8% actually does end up being a lot. We, we just had a call from a lady yesterday who pipes had frozen. She's bedridden. She can't get out of bed. Her income is actually uh, less than her bills. We're going to help her get her pipes fixed. 
Uh, we have helped people at Christmas time. We've helped people who were having financial struggles. We, as we saw, we helped people that had uh, uh, had unexpected death. The eight percent. We are doing a lot of work here in our community, and it has changed some people for the better. So. As we go to our tithes and offering this morning, think about this word tikkun olam. Think about the fact that we have an opportunity to be able to help perfect or repair the world that we live in. Not Bryce come up and uh, maybe Caleb to give him a hand. We'll go ahead and take our, uh, our tithes and offering. I'm going to pray, and after I get done praying, uh, watch this uh, short video as it tells of the upcoming events as, uh, as, I, uh, as I get set up here to begin to bring the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for those that have come here this morning. We thank you for the opportunities that we have as a church, not just to meet together for one hour or two hours on, on Sunday morning, but a great opportunity for us to meet together. And it's one body of Christ, a local body of Christ, that we can go out into this community and we can have an effect on people's lives. Father, we thank you. As we looked around, as Jennifer and I talked this week, as I talked to my wife this week, as I talked to my mom this week, you know, what we realized was sometimes this little church does more than some of the bigger churches because they get relying upon what they've already done. And, and here we go out, and, and, and this body of Christ, these people in this room, Lord, they go out and they minister your word. They go out and, and help people. We have small groups. We have so much going on, Lord, and we're just so grateful and so thankful that we can be your hands and feet. Help us, Lord, to perfect and repair this world that we live in. Lord, for your glory, Father, we thank you and ask all this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hi there everyone, I know I was just in front of you singing and playing music with the praise team and now I'm here in this monitor to tell you all about some things we have going on here at the Odyssey Church. Is this a more interesting way to find out everything that's happening? I just hope I can climb out of this screen before Pastor Rob delivers the message, otherwise those slides might hurt my head when they come up on the screen. First of all, I just want to say again to everyone who braved the cold and wind and came out last week, thank you. Like I said last week, you are all warriors and to those who weren't here, then you missed a really special message. Now this is the point where I'm supposed to tell you that if you missed any sermons or you just really want to watch your favorite ones again, like the time I spoke about joy, check it out. Uh, go online to the www.theodysseychurch.com. But I'm not going to do that because you already have, right? Well, if you have it, I'll tell anyone. So, Okay, so who liked the snow we had the past week? I mean, I did. I mean, I got to miss school on Tuesday. I mean, who doesn't love a snow day? You know what else I missed though? Our movie night on Friday. The cold, we had to move it to Tuesday at 7, so therefore we will continue our small group discussion on Friday. You should have received an email about this from Jennifer, our web guru, but if you didn't, then fill out the email on your connection card and stick it in the basket and we will make sure that you get it next week. And the snow also meant that we had to cancel some events like our Ash Wednesday service on the previous Wednesday, which was supposed to kick off our Lenten celebrations. It doesn't matter that we weren't together though as Lent is now officially going on and this Wednesday we invite you to join us and several hundred of our closest church friends for the very first Wednesday night Lenten soup and salad dinner followed by a joint service. Each week it's being hosted by a different church and this week it's being held by our good friends at Bethel Tabernacle in Clarkville. The dinner starts at 6 o'clock and the service starts at 7. And I hope to see you there, and you, and you, and you way in the back of the Beatles shirt on. You better be there. Next up is a very exciting announcement. The town of Selbyville has invited the Odyssey Church to join them in a community-wide Easter egg hunt starting on the 28th of March at 10. The event will be at the park and is sure to be fun for everyone. The Odyssey Church will be providing some of the eggs to be hunted and hosting a face painting table. So if you're creative or just like to hang out and have fun, plan to join us and be sure to wear your Odyssey I'm Mad t-shirt. I have one right here on. And if you don't have a shirt, no problem. See our web guru Jennifer to, and she will definitely hook you up with one. And now with that, I'm going to now invite our illustrious Pastor Rob Welsh to take the stage. And I'm going to try and figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> hey, where's the back door? <sighs> I don't know whether you call it all that or not, but we do have a good week coming up. Uh, we did have to cancel some events last week. Now, the good news for me is I already have an Ash Wednesday service prepared for next year. 
Anyway, um, we do have, uh, we did move our movie night, uh, the, the Easter experience, to Tuesday night because of the weather. Uh, uh, if, if it ever snows like this again, will somebody call me and just say, hey, will you clean the parking lot? Because the day of church is not the day to try to clean the parking lot. <laughs> I just found that out this morning, okay? Um, Wednesday night, we do have an ecumenical event, which ecumenical is just a fancy word for all the churches at, at Bethel uh, Tabernacle. Uh, our church is very involved in the ministerium, and the ministerium uh, posts this. Uh, we hosted it before at another church. <coughs> it's usually between 100 and 150 people there. And uh, we have a short message. Uh, but when you know me, the, the greatest part about it for me is there is a lot of food. So we have soup and salad and uh, bread uh, in, in honor of our Lenten time of year. And then Friday night, we are going to go ahead and start our small group study on the Easter experience, which will be based on the movie. But even if you miss the movie, you're not going to lose anything in the small text. Uh, context was we just take parts of that and, and we discuss it. See how it applies to our life. That's what small groups about is how can we take this and apply it to our life. But uh, hopefully by now we've all warmed up. It's been a cold week. Uh, told uh, told everybody last week that uh, sometimes God answers your prayers. You just need to be a little bit more specific about how you pray. I said I've been looking for some weather with a seven in it. I'm, I'm thinking 72, 73, 74 would be good. Last week when I showed up, it was negative seven. I'm like, Lord, thank you for the seven in the weather. Uh, I will be more specific as I begin to pray from now on out. For all of you that are here this week, uh, like people that like to sleep in, uh, we, we are going to start 1115 service next week. And as you can tell, uh, it's not because of the size of our congregation. Uh, we just know people like to sleep in. But uh, even for those that don't like to sleep in, the real reason we're doing that is we have several people that we've talked to that would really like to volunteer. We, 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 and we feel that people need to hear the message, so how do we come up with a plan so that we can have them volunteer and at the same time not miss the messages? And what we came up with is we're going to have a 9.30 family service, and we're hoping by Easter time we have enough volunteers that we have a great nursery ministry, preschool ministry, children's ministry, uh, middle age school ministry, and and then the people that volunteer at the 9.30 service can stay and enjoy the worship service and enjoy the music and enjoy the, hopefully the, the speaking as well uh, at the 11.15 service. So that, that idea behind it is that we are prepared for Easter. We are praying. We would ask you to pray. Uh, our goal is, and, and we have a, actually have a plan, because if you're not purposeful about things, things don't take place, and we're very purposeful about it. Uh, our plan is to have, uh, uh, and our prayer is that we have 100 people between the two services on Easter Sunday. We're diligently already working on that. We have plans in the way. We've had phone calls made. We're refocusing and rethinking some things. So our prayer is, is that Easter Sunday, between two services, we have over 100 people here, but at least 100. And I believe that we can do that. So what I'd like is if you would pray about what part you can play in what the vision of the Odyssey Church is, because um, we're going to need some help. Uh, you know, we, we, we talk about it every week, but we believe that church is more than just coming to church on a Sunday morning and then leaving and not doing anything the rest of the week. It's about getting involved. And whether you get involved at the Odyssey or you get involved in somewhere else, and I know others of you have many ministries, uh, but we believe this is a great place to work. We, as you've already heard this morning and heard through other week, we minister to a, a lot of people that are either unchurched or housebound or ill, or um, quite frankently, uh, some of the people we minister to are people that have lost uh, children, people who have lost their parents, uh, people who have uh, are in the process of losing their parents. So please pay back what role you can be, uh, specifically about the young people, because what we don't think about sometimes is even our, our young youngest people in, in, in less than uh, eight or nine years, they're going to be the people running our country, they're going to be the people running our companies, they're going to be running... Uh, our churches, uh, they're going to be running our, our social organization, and statistically, if a child doesn't find Christ by the time they're 14 years old, uh, they're very likely, very unlikely to ever find that. There are uh, obviously some uh, people that don't fit into that, that mold. I know a guy that came to Christ at 79 and a half, and he is on fire for Jesus today. But statistically, if they don't reach Christ by 14, they don't reach him. And even a, a scarier statistic is, even those that are involved in churches, very involved, active, church every week, involved in youth group, at 18 when they go away to college, about 80% of those walk away from Christ. 
But, but here's the experience I think most of us have had. Uh, there's usually, if you think back on your life, there, there's a person who has made your life better. There's a person who's had a positive influence on your life. Uh, maybe it was in church, maybe it was in a workplace, maybe it was somewhere else. But wouldn't it be really cool if one day somebody looked back on their life and said you were the person that had the positive influence, that you took the time out of your life to minister to them in such a way that you changed the direction of their life. Now, there's only one way that you can guarantee yourself that you won't be that person, and that is never do anything, never get involved in anything. You will guarantee that you'll never be that person, but if you get involved, you can be the person who changes the direction of somebody's life for the better. So I want to remind you again on the back of those connection cards, uh, there's a place for you to offer to volunteer, and, and if somebody wants to get involved in one of the many ministries that we have here, you just let me know. Uh, somebody from the church will contact you this week. Again, if you missed last week, as you've already heard, we're not going to hold that against you. It was cold. It was bitter cold. Uh, some people came out. It was really a strange week. Uh, a lot of people that are our regular attenders weren't here, and then we had first-time visitors here. It, it was a strange week, so God had everything under control. But if you weren't here last week, you may not know that we started a new uh, sermon series called Reverse the Curse. Now, we're going to be looking at Matthew 17, 14 through 21 today, not 24. That's my mistake. I put that on there. Uh, Matthew 17, uh, 14 through 21. And again, I just, you know, I know you've already been reminded of this twice. If you want some bragging rights about being able to see every message in this series, you can always go to www.theodysseychurch.com and watch it there. It should be there for as long as there's an internet, as long as there's electricity. Uh, so, uh, Please, please, yeah, uh, the lessons are independent, but they sort of build upon themselves, so if you want to watch that message, feel free to do so. But to refresh your memory, if you weren't here last week, and sort of to catch you up, last week was what we call Transfiguration Sunday, and even though we don't always preach about what's on the church calendar, we did talk about the Transfiguration of Jesus last week. And, and the Transfiguration of Jesus is where Jesus takes... We have his closest uh, uh, disciples. He, he takes Peter, James, and John, and he goes to the top of a mountain to pray. But something strange happens. They, they're tired when they get up there, and, and Peter, James, and tired, they lay down, they take a little nap, and when they wake up, and the Bible is very clear, this wasn't a dream, this wasn't uh, uh, some kind of vision, that this, they, the Bible says they were completely awake. When they wake up, Something strange has happened. Jesus has changed. He's been transformed. He's been transfigured. Some uh, translations say he was changed from the inside out. His face, if you can imagine this, his face was as bright as the sun. His clothes were as white as the light. And there's Moses and Elijah with him. Now Moses has been dead for thousands of years. Elijah has been dead for 700 years. But they're there. Now what great hope that gives us about our resurrection. But... Peter even talks about this later in his epistles. This was a, a life-changing event for these people. And Peter, P Peter's this man of action. Peter just decides he's got to do something. You know, he's not, he just can't sit there and watch all this. He says, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'm going to make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, what some people say is that, that Peter was so wrapped up in this. He was having such a great experience. The glory of God was upon him. He just, he just wanted to build these tabernacles. He wanted to build these memorials so that, that the experience would just last longer. He, he just didn't want it to end. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had that. I, I, I'm very fortunate. I, I, I go to occasionally to uh, Coryville, Pennsylvania, to a place called Black Rock. It's a three-day men's event. There's 120 to 140 men up there, and we worship, and, and it's just amazing. And, and, and when 12 o'clock on Sunday comes, when we take our communion, that means the weekend's about to end, and we do everything <coughs> we can to drag it out as long as we can because we just don't want to come off that mountaintop. Maybe, maybe it wasn't church. You know, maybe it was church. Maybe you've been worshiping. Church. Maybe you've been in a service that's so exciting that you just wish it would last forever. And, and, and if you've never done that, you know, maybe today's message is for you. Because here's what I know. is God's not looking for people who come to church and just want to get out of church. He's looking for people who want to get into church. He's looking for people who want to be part of the body of Christ and, and make a difference. But like I said last week, you know, sometimes there's a time to rest. Sometimes there's a time to worship. And sometimes there's a time to work. We all love those mountaintop experiences. We've all had them. But there comes a time when we have to get off the mountain. There comes a time when we have to get back into the valley. 
and, and, and sometimes, you know, again, I tell you, I'm a visual person, so I, I see things, you know. I don't know if you've ever seen these pictures of the people that climbed Mount Empress and some of these taller mountains are standing up there with the flag and their hands on their hip. I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? But what do you see? All you see is rocks and snow. The air is thin, you know. There's no growth on top of the mountain. The growth takes place down in the valley. We don't like that, but that's where it's true. That's where the trees and, and that's where the, 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 the animals are. That's where the grass is. That's, it, it, all the growth takes place in the valley. Same way in our lives. We get these mountaintops experience. It's easy to have faith, but our growth takes place down in the valley. The trees, the vegetation, the animals, it's all in the valleys. And whether we like it or not, in our own lives, most of our growth, most of our spiritual growth, takes place in the valley. There comes a time when we have to leave the mountaintop. There comes a time when we have to get off the mountain and go back into uh, the valley. But maybe this is happening to you. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're on a church experience. Maybe you were on vacation. Or, or maybe you have gone to a, a special event, a ball game, or a movie, and, and it's just so great, you just don't want it to end. And, and, and you know when it ends that you're going to have to go back to work. And you know when you go back to work, there's going to be a mountain of paperwork. Or, or you're in the middle of trials and tribulations, and, and there's something going on in your life, and, and you had this momentary break, and you just hate for it to end because you've got to go back to the problems in the world. You know, as soon as you, you go home back to work, you're going to have to face the world again. You're going to have to face all of its problems. You're at the top of the middle, mountain one day, and then the next day you're going to be in a valley you're going to have to face the devil. It's easy. It's easy to have faith when you're on top of the mountain. It's easy to have faith when you see Jesus glorified. It's easy to have faith when you're in, in the middle of prayer and worship and you just shut the world out. You don't need a lot of faith then when you're on top of the mountain top. But... But you need the faith when you head down the mountain. You need the faith when you're in the middle of the valley. You need the faith when you're facing the trials and tribulations of this world. So here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to get this picture, because we have to see the physical picture before we can see the spiritual application. We have to see the physical picture before we can take the application and apply it to our lives. So let's get the scene in our heads. Jesus has been on top of the mountain with Peter, James, and John. He's been transfigured. He's been transformed. They are, are having the experience of their lifetime. And we have to remember that James and John and, and Peter have been following Jesus for years. They have seen miracles. They have seen the lame begin to walk. They have seen the blind see. They've seen the deaf hear. They've even saved three or four people raised from the dead. They've had a lot of great experience. But this is the experience of the lifestyle. They've seen Jesus in their glorified body. They hear God audibly say, this is my dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. And it, it, it almost appears, it doesn't say this, but it almost appears as that they, they bent down to pray, and when they opened their eyes up, there's Jesus again in his human body. Jan uh, Elijah and Moses are gone, and, and Jesus says, okay, boys, it's time to come off the mountain. It, it's time to head back down. And you can imagine, they just don't want to leave. Yeah, this has been too great of an experience. Maybe you've had something like that. Maybe, maybe in your life there, there was a ball game, a football game, or, or a spiritual weekend. You know, I, I went on this weekend one time called Emmaus. And, and, and the last thing they tell you when you go on this weekend is you're getting ready to go back in the world. It's not always going to be like we had this weekend. You, you've seen God at the top of the mountain. But tomorrow you're going to go back to work. So maybe you've had experience. You just don't want it to end. Now, my prayer is, and what I'm working towards, and what our lead team is working for, that we can make that trip this way. I mean, people love to go to a ball game. They don't care if they stay there three or four hours. People love to go to a movie. They'll sit down and watch a good movie for two and a half hours. People are standing in line to see a movie right now that does not glorify God. It's breaking themselves. They're, 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 you see commercials on TV for this. Why can't we make church that way? Why can't we make church so exciting that the music's so good, the children's ministry so good, the preaching hopefully so good that people will want to come to church and not want the service to end? That's my vision. That's what I see the Odyssey Church. But anyway, back, back to the message. Peter, James, and John, they've had the, 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 the experience of a lifetime. But where are the rest of the disciples? Where are the other nine disciples? They're at the bottom of the mountain. So Jesus and, and Peter and James and John, they, they start to head down the mountain. And no sooner, no sooner than they get to the bottom of the mountain from seeing Jesus in the heavenly glory, 
the mountaintop experience, they're confronted with an earthly problem. They go from God's glory and his power, and immediately they're facing Satan and his power. So look what's going on at the bottom of the mountain. Let's look at the trials and the tribulations, so to speak, in the valley. And we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 14. We're going to go through verse 21. Um, and this, this, this account is also recorded in the Gospels of Mark and the Gospels of Luke. So I'm going to draw from some of their uh, inferences as well, but sometimes we can get a better picture from putting them all together. Like I said earlier, we all know you don't need faith when you're standing on top of the mountain seeing Jesus glorified, when you're in the presence of the glory of God. But when you come down that mountain, when you're in the valley, when you're facing Satan, that's when you need faith. So I, I'm going to tell you, I've been diligently praying for the last three or four days that we can see this physical picture and then we can see the spiritual application and then we can see how to take it to our lives so that when we get in a battle, when we're facing trials and tribulation, when we're facing the Satan, when he's attacking those that we love, we can see how to apply that to our lives so that we can live life and live it more abundantly. So as we get started, I want you to know that at the bottom of this mountain, there's six groups of people. And we're going to look at each one of them and tell a little bit about it. We're going to look at the physical picture and then we're going to look at the spiritual picture. First of all, we have the nine disciples. Peter, James, and John, the other three with Jesus, have been at the top of the mountain. But the nine disciples are at the bottom of the mountain. And the nine disciples have had a very public and a very bad failure in their ministry. It's very public, and it's very bad. And as far as the record goes, this is the first time the disciples have ever had a public failure. As far as the record goes, this is the first time that they have ever failed in their ministry. They had tried to keep cast out a demon, and they weren't able to do it. And it was public, and it was a large failure, and everybody knew about it. Starts out, at the foot of the mountains, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came. Now, when it says, at the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them, that, that means Jesus and Peter and James and John. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord. So here's this man. He's kneeling at Jesus as he comes off the mountain. He said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He had seizures and he suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Now, I, I'm not an expert on Greek. But I study people who are experts on Greek. And, and, and in English, and we have a past tense, a, a present tense, and a future tense. But in the Greek, there is what they call a continual tense. So the Greek implies that they had these disciples that kept trying to cast this demon out. It, it's written in the continual sense. They just didn't try to cast it out one time and say, okay, we can't do it. I'll see you later. They kept trying, and they kept trying, and they kept trying, and they kept keep on trying, and they couldn't cast it out. And what you may not know, maybe you do know, is especially in Luke, because the, the story of this story in Luke happened right before Jesus does something else for his disciples. He sends them out into the world. Luke records it, and in chapter 9, verse 1 of his gospel, he said he called his 12 disciples together, and he said, boys, I'm going to send you out into the world, and I'm going to give you power, and I'm going to give you authority over all devils. Not some devils, not a few devils, but I'm going to give you power and authority over all devils, and you're going to be able to heal diseases. Disciples have been given the power to cast out demons. They had the authority to cure diseases. So I'm, I'm thinking, since they've done it before, and this is the first time they couldn't do it, that, that they're probably a little confused. <coughs> they could have happened before. They cast out demons for it. They healed them. But this time, for some reason, they just couldn't do it. These nine disciples are at the bottom of the mountain in front of this large crowd, in front of, uh, as we're going to see soon, in front of some religious people, and they're red faced. They're embarrassed. They tried to glorify God. They tried to do what they'd done in the past, and it couldn't happen. Now, have you ever done that? I mean, I mean, I used to shoot pool. I love to shoot pool. And there were times when I looked at a table, and I said, this is not a problem. And everybody that knew me would know this isn't a problem. And I get up to shoot, and the very first shot, I make something stupid, miscue or something like that, and I blow the whole table. And you're embarrassed. You're like, I've done this a million times and I can't do this. What's wrong with me? Well, that's where these disciples were. So the next few that we have 
<coughs> the religious way. Matthew leaves this out, but it is important in the Gospel of Mark. And the religious leaders of the time, the religious teachers of the time, we call them scribes, when Jesus gets there, these disciples and, and, and the religious teachers, they, they, they're arguing. Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through 16, sort of records it like this. He says, when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them. And some teachers of the religious law, what we call the scribes, were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they started to hit to him with awe, and they ran to greet him. And here's Jesus, and, and, and I, I, I love Jesus, because he says, what's all this arguing about? Now, Jesus is God. He knows what they argue about. How many times has Jesus asked you a question to make you answer the question so that you know the answer? Make you know it for yourself. So you can almost see the, these religious teachers, these scribes as they were called, and they can't pass this opportunity up. What's the matter, boys? You know, we, we know there was conflict between the religious people of the time and Jesus and his disciples. I mean, there's no conflict in churches ever today, but there was then. They just can't pass this opportunity up. And, 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 you know, some people, they just wait for you to fail, don't they? They just want to see you fail. And, and they're like, what's the matter, boys? Uh, you can't cast me out, can you? Yeah, you what you do? You lose your power? What? When Jesus is here, you can, but when he's gone, you can't. You can't do nothing without Jesus here. So you got, you got these nine remaining disciples. you got the religious teachers. And, of course, you, you have the crowd. And, again, it's the Gospel of Mark, which tells us it, it was a huge crowd. So you can almost see it. You know, a good fight always draws a, a good crowd. I don't remember if you were in the high school or in junior high. That fight break out. You didn't really care who won. But you were going to surround it and you were going to egg it on because you wanted to see some action. You wanted to see the people fight. Good fight always brings a crowd. So you got this big crowd surrounding the disciples and, and the religious leaders and they're fighting. Here comes Jesus walking off. The disciples can't cast the, disease, the demon out. And the religious leaders are arguing. Here comes Jesus just sort of calmly walking towards the crowd. So you got the picture so far? Peter, James, and John have just had a mountaintop experience. They have a lifetime. They've seen Jesus glorified on top of the mountain. But now they're off the mountain. They're back into the craziness of the world. And there's problems. The first thing they're confronted with is this great big mob. And the rest of the disciples arguing with a whole bunch of religious leaders. And here comes the crowd. Here comes the world. And here comes the trials and the tribulations in the valley, so to speak. And then there was a child's father. And it's Luke that tells us that not only was this child the man's only boy, it was his only child. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had a child that was sick. Can you imagine what this boy was going through? You know, you know how hard it is to watch your children when they're sick and maybe they're in a hospital and you don't know whether they're going to live or die. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's such a horrible feeling. And, and then you got the boy. Boy, we sort of get them all the way to the gospel. The father says that, that the, the spirit scarcely leaves him. It's almost always with this boy. We're told the spirit is destroying him from the inside out. The boy thumbs at the mouth. Uh, and the body goes rigid and then he goes into convulsions. The scripture says that he couldn't talk. He grits his teeth in pain. And I, I looked at the father. I said, how much agony had the father had he holds his only child, he watches and scream out in pain, he, he can't talk, he's having convulsions, he's foaming at the mouth, and the father watches all this. There's nothing at all he can do. And we don't know how old this boy is, but Mark says that this boy has been this way since he was a little child. And according to Mark, it's the demon that gets this boy to throw himself into the water and throw himself at the fire trying to get this boy to kill himself. His father has one last hope to save his child. He brings his child to the disciples, and the disciples can't cast it out. Now, this is a whole lot different than the experience that Peter, James, and John are now going through than when they were on the mountaintop. When they were sitting there with Jesus in his glorified body, the disciples, Peter, James, and John, had just come off the mountain. They've seen the glory of God, and now they're in the valley down below, and there is nothing but suffering and pain and anger. And this is why this is important. Because I believe we've all had those experiences, haven't we? 
I mean, if you, you had, a, had an experience that was just really great, you just didn't want it to end. And then the next day, you're back in the real world, and there's pain, and there's suffering, and your kid's sick, or there's a problem at work, or, 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 or the bill collectors are called. That's why this is so ethical, because we've all experienced this at some time. This is so relevant to every one of us. But here's the thing. The scene may have changed from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the valley, but one thing hasn't changed. This is no emergency for Jesus. He's the same on the mountain as he is in the valley. And we have this tendency to do what people in the valley were doing. We have this tendency, when we get into the valley, when we get into our trials, when we get into our tribulation, when we get into a fight, when we get into anger, is to run to Jesus and say, Jesus, what are you going to do now that we're in trouble? What are you going to do now that we can't fix this on our own? But here's what you have to know. Jesus knows the situation. Jesus, you may be upset. You may be running around like a chicken with your head cut off, but not Jesus. Jesus is still at ease. He's still in control. So we have the disciples there. We have the scribes there. We have the crowd there. We have the boy's father there. We have the son there. But there's one more person that's there as well. And this person is the cause of everything that's going on. Satan's there. The demon's there. And he's had a victory, at least temporarily. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? They're pretty strong words coming from Jesus, isn't it? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon in the boy and left him from that moment. Not the next day, not the next week, but from that moment... The boy was well. Afterwards, the disciples asked Jesus privately, after the crowds had left, after everybody gone, Jesus comes up and says, why couldn't we cast out that demon? Jesus said, you don't have enough faith. Jesus told him, I, I tell you the truth, if you had the faith even as small as a mountain seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Jesus said, bring that boy to me. And then right in front of Jesus, and Mark gives us the details. Satan throws the boy into another convulsion. Satan wants to destroy and corrupt. This final convulsion is so bad, so strong, it knocks the boy unconscious. He goes to him, and everybody thinks the, the boy's dead. You ever had a situation out there? You know, the, the situation looks hopeless. God, I've prayed to you. I've done all I can. I've seen your works in the past, but this is dead. It ain't going nowhere. I can't fix it, and you can't fix it. One commentator explained it like this. Satan was like a bad tenant. He's received his eviction notice, and he hates his landlord, and he is going to destroy the house any way that he can. He knows he's been evicted, so he's going to tear the house apart before he leaves. That's the scene. That's the picture. Satan's leaving and he's going to tear this house up, this boy up, the best that he can before he leaves. Now that's the physical picture. Let's look at the principle. Because you have to know the scene, you have to know the physical picture before you can understand what's going on and how we can apply it to life. You've got frustrated disciples. You've got mocking religious leaders. You've got curious crowd. You've got a broken hearted father. You've got a suffering child. And you've got a vicious enemy. You've got Satan himself. The demon's there. And then Jesus comes down from the mountain and he calmly just enters the scene. May we see the spiritual principle and then may God give us the grace to apply it to our lives. And I believe this is a principle. I believe this is what God is saying and it is so simple that we miss it. God wants spiritual people to do spiritual work. Amen. It's as simple as that. God wants spiritual people to do spiritual work. And that's not too deep for any of us, is it? That's the principle. Now the good news is, if you're experiencing a spiritual warfare, that means you're in the battle. The bottom line is, if you never ever experience any spiritual warfare, you may have never ever got into the battle. It's like a friend of mine told me one time, if you don't face the devil occasionally, it may be because you're going in the same direction. Now, I'm not saying that about anybody in here. I'm just saying, look at your situation. If you've never experienced a spiritual battle, you may not be in a spiritual world. And this is a spiritual war, as we're going to see later. So that's the good news. 
A spiritual disciple of Christ is a person that not only sees Jesus glorified, a spiritual disciple of Christ is one where his or her power comes from Christ himself, and they know when they're in the battle that it's not them fighting the battle, it's Jesus fighting the battle for them. Jesus comes right out and tells us what the problem is. Jesus says, unbelief, or as the New Living Translation that we're reading from today says, Jesus says, you don't have enough faith. <laughs> That's the problem. You don't have enough faith. And look who he's talking to. You know, maybe he's talking to the crowd, but I'm thinking he's probably talking, well, I know he's talking to disciples because they're talking to him privately. He's talking to his disciples who have seen <laughs> Jesus heal people, He's seen people that were blind, that can now see, deaf, that can now hear, lame, that can now walk. They've even seen him raise people from the dead. And, and he's telling them, you don't have enough faith. Your faith is too small. And here's what we know. This man knows Jesus. It says, at the foot of the crowd, a large crowd was waiting for them. And the man came and knelt before Jesus as the Lord. He said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He calls him Lord. He kneels before him. And don't miss what he says here because he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. If it, it was me, I'm thinking if it was my child, I, I might ask God for grace. I, I might say, God, you know, I know I'm a sinner. I, I know that. You know that. Just have grace. Don't take it out on my child. I need grace, Lord. I, I need you to, 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 to let my child up from here, please. But not this man. This man knew that it wasn't grace that he needed. It was mercy I might pray like this, Lord, you know that, it, that it's me that's done wrong. Not, he's had this since he was a child. He's innocent. This man knew that it was mercy, not grace in me. And both Mark and Luke tell us in their gospel, this is not a physical problem. This is a spiritual problem. Says he has seizures and he suffers terribly. He often falls into fire of the water. So I brought him to your disciples and, and they couldn't heal him. And again, we're not sure who Jesus is talking to. You know, was he talking to the disciples? Was he talking to the teachers of the law? I mean, he'd done that in the past. Is it the Father? Is it the crowd? Is it all of them? But Jesus gives this rebuke. And at the same time, he gives an encouragement, like Jesus can do, that none of us can really do that well. And he says, Jesus, you, you faithless and corrupt people. How long do I have to put up with you? How long must I be with you? You just bring the boy to me. Mark gives us even more detail. Mark says, Teacher, I brought my son to you so you could so I brought my son so you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit sees him, it throws him violently to the ground. He foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And the father says something. The father says, Lord, have mercy on us if you can. Jesus, I love the way Jesus responds to it. Jesus says, if I can. What do you mean, if I can, Jesus says. Anything is possible for those who believe. It sort of sounds like Jesus is saying, you're questioning me whether if I can? Don't you mean, will I can? Or will I? It looks like Jesus is offended by this. But he's not. He, he's not offended. He's just correcting He's saying, I need you to put your trust in God because you know I can, but you don't know if I will. Pray that I can, or pray that I will because you know that I can. See, a spiritual disciple, spiritual person of Jesus Christ is one that trusts God unconditionally. Unconditionally. The context here is unbelief and lack of faith. It's not just trusting Jesus when you're on the top of the mountain and you're experiencing this glorious things that are going on. It's trusting when you're in the valley. It's trusting when trials and tribulation you come along. And God says, anything is possible if a person believes. And what Mark account says, and I, and, and, and I, and I see this, you know, I, I've got kids, and I've had kids that were sick. The man breaks down in tears. He breaks out in tears and says, Lord, I do believe. I do believe. But can you help me overcome my unbelief? 
Now, which one of us haven't prayed that prayer at one time? Even those that people look at and say, you're, you're a man of faith. You're not, it doesn't matter. We've all prayed that prayer at one time. Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And then Matthew says, it left him from that very moment. The boy was well. When all this is over, you know, Matthew says that the disciples, they just go to Jesus after the crowds are broken up, after the father and the boy, and, and they come to him and say, Jesus, we've done this in the past. Why couldn't we do it now? Verse 19 says, afterwards, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast the demon out? And Jesus gives them, and, and he gives us the answer in verse 20. He says, you don't have enough faith. There's the problem again. Your faith is too small. You've walked with me for two and a half years. You've seen miracle after miracle, and you still don't have enough faith. Their faith was too small. Now think about this. If they had physically seen the things that they had seen and their faith was too small, what chance do we have? Honestly. Man, I, I've seen miracles that God has done, but I, I've never seen a shriveled hand just all of a sudden appear. I've never seen somebody who was dead rise up. These disciples, you know, and Jesus said, your faith is too small. Peter just confessed him as the Lord. Chapter 16. He knew he was the Son of God. And, and yet, Jesus is saying, your faith is too small. Jesus told him, I'll tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to here, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. And this is where it gets a little sticky, okay? And I admit it, okay? If you have an NIV Bible, or if you have an NLT like I'm reading from, or any one of the newer translations, you're going to notice something. There is no verse 21. It's not there. Matthew goes right from verse 20 to verse 22 and skips right over verse 21. Now, there's a reason for that. Most of the older manuscripts <coughs> don't have <coughs> Verse 21, the newer manuscripts, which some of the older translations were taken from. So, because of, of, of confirmation and history and things that we found over the years, the oldest manuscripts we have don't have this verse in it. And the belief is that somewhere down the line, one of the people who were translating this Bible or copying it, what we call our Bible, had read the Gospel of Mark and inserted the verse in there. And, and some people use this, and they use it incorrectly to say that our Bibles can't be trusted because they have mistakes. But that's not true. This is not a problem. Because we know from the Gospel of Mark, we know from Mark's account, Jesus said these words. So whether Matthew recorded them or not, really doesn't make a difference because we know without a shadow of a doubt, we know for a fact Jesus did say this. And if Jesus said it, we know it applies. He says, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told him. And I tell you the truth, if you had a faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say that this mountain would move from here to here and it would move, nothing would be impossible. And here's verse 21. However, it starts out however. However, this kind does not go out except by faith. <coughs> Even though this verse may not be in your translation, in Matthew, it is in Mark. And we know it's the words of Jesus because Mark recorded it. And this is what I believe that Jesus is saying. If we miss this, we miss the whole lesson. If we miss this, we miss everything. And it comes down to this. It comes down to God wants spiritual people to do spiritual work. And when we engage in spiritual warfare, God wants spiritual people to do the fight. And if you aren't engaged in spiritual warfare, you're not engaged in the battle. Amen. Now, is this literal fasting and prayer? Getting up an hour early, bowing your heads, putting your hands together, going without food, or going without something else for a couple of hours or a couple of days? I believe that's part of it. But this is what I know about God. He doesn't just want you to go through emotions. So often we do that. We get a Latin counter like this and we check it off. Well, I did that today. We go through emotion. God doesn't want us to go through emotion. He doesn't want us to go through a ritual. He doesn't want us to go through some kind of ceremony. He wants our heart. He wants you. That's what the season of Lent is all about. Growing closer to God. 
And so often we lose sight of the principle. We pray and fast if it's some kind of magical genie, some kind of magical potion. We pray and fast and then check it off our to-do list and say, all right, I've accomplished something today, and now God has to bless me because I did it. But God's not looking for us to do a ceremony. He's looking for us to have our heart. Isaiah 29, 13, uh, the prophet made this statement, and then Jesus uses it twice in the New Testament. Anything God says once, he means, but if he says it two or three times, he really means it. Jesus, who is God, says, the people honor me with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. Now, the, 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 the word farce means a comedy or a tragedy. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is laughable. Their worship is a comedy. Their worship is even tragic. Because their hearts are so far from me. They, they take these man-made commands or man-made ideas and treat them as commands from God. Amen. See, God doesn't want people who look spiritual. He wants people who are spiritual. The disciples had failed to cast the demon out, and they come to Jesus and ask him why, and Jesus says, you don't have enough faith. I tell you the truth, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you could move, say to this mountain, move from here to here, and it would move, and nothing is impossible for him who believes. And again, I, you know, I, I, I think over the years we've misinterpreted this verse. We've heard it preached so many different ways that we forget what it really means. We interpret it like this. Jesus is saying, you failed because you didn't have enough faith. If you had more faith, you wouldn't have failed. But if you had faith of a mustard seed, you could have mountains. Now this is important. Because in a time period then, just like it is today, mountain is a metaphor for trials and tribulations and trouble. Okay? How many times have you heard somebody say, i got a mountain of problem? It's a metaphor. If you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could overcome your trials and your tribulations and your troubles. Because you've got to think about, look at the irony of what's really being said here. Sometimes we miss this. We, we read it over and over and we sort of read it, but we don't, you know, we don't really read it. What's really being said here? What, what did he say? The disciples come and say, why do we fail? And Jesus says, because you had little faith. The disciples says, well, then what do we need? Jesus says, you need little faith. Wait a minute. I fail because I need little faith. But if I had little faith, I wouldn't have failed. Even if I had faith the size of a mustard seed, see the problem? You fail because of little faith, but if you had little faith, you could move mountains. It sort of looks like an oxymoron, something that contradicts itself, but it's not. You couldn't do it because you had small faith. But if you had small faith, even faith the size of a mustard seed, you could do it. Jesus is not comparing. Jesus is contrasting. He's not comparing the demon possessed boy to a mountain, which needs to be removed. The disciples had little faith, right? What could be accomplished with little faith? In fact, what could be accomplished with faith so small that it was like a mustard seed? You can move mountains with little faith. Now think about this. If this is confusing to us, how confusing must it have been to the disciples? They had seen mountains move in their ministry. They had seen signs and wonder. People were being healed. Demons were being cast out. Mountains were being moved all the time. We think that verse says, great faith moves big mountains. But that's not what it says. It says, small faith moves big mountains. I think the disciples had forgotten the principle just like we so often forget the principle of what Jesus is trying to teach us. They had forgotten where the power came from. We, we look at this and it, and it says, why couldn't we cast out the demon? See, when it comes to trials and tribulations and trouble, sometimes God just simply lets us get us out of the mess that we put ourselves into, doesn't he? And we get so used to getting ourselves out of our own mess, we think we can do it on our own and we get used to moving mountains. And we forget where the power to move mountains come from. Why couldn't we drive the demon out? Because you never could drive demons out. Jesus tells us, and it's recorded from the Bible from the very beginning to the very end, that you were given the power and authority. It wasn't belonged to you. You were given the power and authority to drive demons out. 
It was never your power. It was never your authority. It was always God's power. It was always God's authority. Don't trust in yourself and your power. Trust in God and His power. It's God's power that moves mountains. Don't have faith to move mountains. Have faith in the God that moves mountains. We're trying to do it in our own strength. They had forgotten the source of their strength. They had to turn from the mountain and turn back to Jesus. God wants spiritual people to do spiritual work. See, when we're facing something that's bigger than a mountain, little faith ain't going to work. Little faith can move mountains. But Jesus is saying, you've got a bigger problem than a mountain here. That's why verse 21 begins with the word, however. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Little faith can move a mountain. However, this isn't a mountain. This, is, this isn't physical. This is spiritual. It takes more than a little faith. He says you have little faith, but it's time to move on and move up. You have to keep going so you get to the really good stuff. Moving mountains is good, but it only takes a little faith to overcome your trials and your tribulations and your trouble. If you want to overcome in spiritual warfare, you've got to get spiritual. And the only way to get spiritual is through prayer and fasting. God uses spiritual people to do spiritual work. Our prayer needs to be the same as His Father's. Lord, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Because all things are possible to Him who believes. God uses spiritual people to do spiritual work. And the more spiritual the instrument is, the more mighty the work that God can use through the instrument. That's the secret of the power in our lives. That, that, that's what gives us the power. Prayer and fasting unlocks the door to faith. That's why you were given those calendars when you came in the door and they're sitting right up here. So that, that you can begin to pray and, pray and fast and read the scriptures. Because the people here at the Odyssey Church need to be spiritual people. Because we're in spiritual warfare. We can build a big church in our own power. You spend enough money on advertising, and you put enough entertainment up here, we can build our own church in our own power. But what we can't do is transform lives and transform this community in our own power. We need God's power for that. We are in a spiritual battle. We need spiritual people to do spiritual warfare. It's time to stand up and step in and get into the battle. Step in and step up and, and start the fight. The more you pray and fast, the more you know the Word of God, the closer you get to God, the closer you get to God, the more you trust God, the more you trust God, the more power you have. I mean, the fact is, this ain't rocket science. It's simple. God uses spiritual people for spiritual warfare. God uses spiritual people to do spiritual work. And He's calling us, He's calling this church to be spiritual people. Prayer and fasting, it draws us closer to God. And the closer we get to God, the more we're going to trust God. The more we trust God, the more faith we have. And the more faith we have, the more power we have. And the more God can use us for His glory and our honor. Real faith is that we draw strength from God in order to give it to others. Meeting God in the secret place so we can meet man in the marketplace. You don't need faith when you're in the top of a mountain and the glory of God is surrounding you. You need faith when you're in the valley and you're facing the devil. But even small and underdeveloped faith has power. So whether you're in the mountaintop or you're in the valley, even small, mount, even small faith can move mountains. But you've got to get to the good stuff. You've got to get to the real power. You have to turn from the mountain and turn to Jesus. You have to be able to persevere and have victory in the spiritual battle. And that only comes by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting are the keys that unlocks the door of faith. God uses spiritual people to do spiritual work. The battle with Satan is real. And it's difficult. And it's ongoing. Victory in spiritual battle only comes through Jesus Christ not through our own power. That was the problem with the disciples. They got used to doing it in their own power. They had got used to moving mountains and they forgot where the power came from. They had neglected their spiritual lives. And when you neglect your spiritual life, you get unplugged from the source of your power. Because they got so used to moving mountains they began to forget the source of the power that moved the mountains. And as a result, their prayer life and their spiritual life had obviously began to suffer. So they began to rely on themselves instead of God. See, faith isn't like money. We can't store it in the bank and use it later. We have to have a daily renewing. We have to, it's a constant process. It's not just rote repetition. 
but drawing closer to God and trusting Him more. And the more we trust God, the more we rely on God, the more we rely on God, the more power God gives us. And the more power God gives us, the more power we can use it for His glory and our honor. Look at the mountain and God looks small. Look to God and the mountain looks small. And here's the, he, he, and I, I struggle with this myself. Maybe you guys don't. I struggle with this myself. You know, God, we want the power. We know we have the power, but we want to do it without having to do the work. <clears throat> we just want the power, but God says, if you want my power, it's going to take time and effort. It's going to take time and effort and reading my word so you can use my word for power. It's going to take time and effort so that, uh, that if you can fast, so you can draw closer to me and, and, and stop blocking the world and start looking to me. If you're going to, if you don't want the power, it's going to take time and effort. You're going to have to pray so you can have the power of the Holy Spirit. It, 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 it's just... It's not need. It's just God wants spiritual people to do spiritual work. It's really that simple. Don't settle for a faith that only moves mountains. Go after the kind that doesn't come except by prayer and fasting. The shame, the shame of the churches in America today is that we have all this power that's available to us, and yet we fail to take a hold of it. Amen. Romans 8 11 tells us that, that if we've made Jesus Christ Lord over our lives and we put our trust in Him, not just calling Him Savior, that's easy, making Him Lord over your life and trusting Him that you have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, but we don't tap into it by prayer and fasting so it just lies dormant. Amen. It is so. You ever wonder this? You wonder why two people that look the same, sort of speak the same, sort of have the same mission, two ministries, they sound the same, they use the same sort of, one speaks with power and one falls flat. What's the difference? Why, why are some anointed and not others? And the answer is it's always the same. The one who trusts Jesus unconditionally is the one who gets the anointing. And the one who trusts Jesus unconditionally is the one that's praying and fasting. The one that lets go of the world and takes hold of God. That's a hard attitude. That's a direction of the Spirit. Without prayer and fasting, great things can't be done. Yes, God wants to bless us. Why does He want to bless us? So that we can do exactly what we talked about earlier. So we can repair and perfect this broken world we live in. You can't straddle two worlds and have God's anointing. You can't want the things of heaven and want the things of the world at the same time and expect to be anointed. God's people are weak to an incomplete surrender. So much power at our disposal and yet we're unable to perform the simplest task. If I'm not being changed, if I'm not being transformed, if I, I'm not lying on hold of God's power and letting go of the world, the most I'm ever going to do is move mountains, but I don't want to just move mountains. I want to have power over Satan and sin, but I'll have no power over Satan and sin unless I'm spiritual. Don't settle for power to move mountains. Don't anybody in here settle for power to move mountains. Anybody can do that even with a little faith. Go after the kind that only comes after prayer and fasting. You don't need the faith to move mountains, you need faith in the God that moves mountains. Those who have learned to pray and fast are the ones that God will save to see and to do mighty works. And don't substitute this, the picture for the reality. You know, sometimes, and I know it because I've done it, you hear a message like this, and you say, well, I'm going to get up a half hour earlier, and I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to read a book about fasting, and I'm going to give up a certain meal, or I'm going to give up a certain thing. We think, okay, now God has to pour out His blessing. I've done all that. That's not what this is about. That's not what the season of Lent is about. It's about renewal and refreshing and going closer to God, repenting of the sin that we see in our life so that we become these spiritual people. It does no good to take a hold of the picture and miss the spiritual reality. You can't make yourself spiritual by self-denial. God's not impressed if you skip lunch. No. We need to pray and we need to fast, but there's a principle here. The picture points to the reality. Embrace God and let go of the world. Are you a spiritual person? that God can use for spiritual works? Or are you just a helpless Christian? Because Jesus expects us to be growing in our faith. Amen. Our trust in Him is to deepen as we depend on Him to overcome our difficulties, as we depend on Him to overcome our challenges. God's never pleased with a stagnant faith. The Lord does demand that we have mountains of faith before He acts on our behalf. Even small faiths, Faith as small as a mustard seed can be used by God. A little mustard seed of genuine faith is all He requires to move mountains. 
He steps in and supplies our lack. But don't settle for that kind of faith. Don't settle for a faith that can just move mountains. Go after the kind that removes Satan's and his demons. Go after the kind that only comes by prayer and fasting. Go after the kind of faith that makes the impossible possible. And think about this. What happens when you plant that mustard seed and you begin to nourish it? And you begin to take care of it. It begins to get rooted. It begins to get strong. Reading of God's Word. And when we do, it begins to grow. It begins to take root. And it begins to get stronger. And the more it grows, the more you're going to trust in the Lord. And the more you trust in the Lord, the more spiritual you're going to become. And the more spiritual you become, the more God is going to use you for His glory and your honor. It's not too deep. God uses spiritual people to do spiritual work. Lay a hold of God and let go of the world. Engage in spiritual warfare with spiritual power. God wants to use spiritual people. And let me assure you, let me assure you, we are in a spiritual battle. And the eternal souls of our loved ones, the eternal souls of the people in our workplaces, the eternal souls of the people in our community, the eternal souls are on the line. It's a spiritual battle of heaven and hell and that's what we're battling over. The world says, show me and I'll believe. And Jesus said, if you believe, I'll show you. Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. Don't look to the mountains in your life and make God look small. Look to the God in your life and make the mountains look small. Don't settle for a faith that just moves mountains. Look to a faith that destroys the root of the mountains. Look to a faith which can endure Satan and his sin. Look to a faith that only comes by prayer and fasting. Don't be a helpless Christian with so much power at your disposal. God wants to use spiritual people to do spiritual work. Don't have faith to move mountains. Have faith in a God to move mountains. Because all things are possible to him or her who believes. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, uh, as we go into this season of Lent, Lord, that you have given us an opportunity that we can take time to, to become more spiritual, to know you better, to, to increase our power, to trust you more. Father, we're a church. We're a body of Christ. We're a local church who desires to please you and the desires to transform not just people, but enough people that we can change our community. Sometimes, Lord, we get discouraged, but we believe, Lord. So help us overcome our unbelief. Help us to put in the hard work to become spiritual people who do spiritual work. Father, we ask this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ, the One who came to die so that we could live. I want to invite you all to come back next week as we continue in this series called Reverse the Curse. And I want you to think about this before next week. Are you childish or are you childlike? And if you think about it, please bring in the names of people, you know, we're asking for six, but if you bring in one that's good, we've had several, I think we've got seven or eight already. Uh, if you know somebody that is unchurched right now, they could be a person professing to be a Christian that just not going to church. If you know somebody that just says, I go to church on Easter and Christmas, let's invite them here. We're going to help you out. You give us their name and number, we'll send them an invitation. When you call, they're already going to have one in their hand. And I want to invite you to come out this Tuesday night and we watch the movie. It's about an hour and a half long. We're going to have a little question and answer, not more than 10 or 15 minutes afterwards. Uh, we're going to have popcorn, we're going to have candy, we're going to have sodas. And uh, for you healthy people, we'll have some healthy stuff too, but the rest of us are going to eat fatty foods. Uh, that will be not the night that I'm uh, skipping or fasting that meal. Uh, I will be trying to abide by the calendar this week. And then come back on Friday night as we start the small group study. Because the movie's great. But just to watch a movie and do nothing with it doesn't change your life. We want to see you transform. We want to see you change. We want to see you become the spiritual people that God uses to do spiritual work. Take those Lent calendars home with you. Begin to pray fast and read your Bible so you can get the battle. And just know that God calls us to step out in faith, to follow where He leads, even if what He calls us to do seems impossible, like starting a new church.
So let's go here with, from here with courage. We trust God in His presence and His power. Be eager to fulfill God's will for your life. And may the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and among you this week. And within you, wherever you go, show people Jesus. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. I hope to see you all next week. God bless you.